On this side of the table, if you do not know him, he's Femi Awojide. He has done amazing works. And um, I will not do much of an introduction because he's going to introduce himself formally. But yeah, uh, I am actually grateful that he flew how many thousand miles to come to our small studio to actually um, have this intimate moment with me, but playing ticket. So it's a big deal for me. So I'm really, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really, really happy that, yeah, that happened. Yeah. You're selling like yes. It, so yeah, um, <laughs> you can can you share a bit about yourself and your background? And, mm. Yes, just an introduction. Yeah. Um. As he said, I am Femi Awujide. <laughs> um, a cinematographer. Yes. Um, I refer my, to myself sometimes as an artist, and sometimes as a scientist. Um, my first degree is in physics. And I went on from physics to do other things, you know. So it's a progression from the science side of things into the art side of things. But, That's interesting. Um, yeah. So my, I, I think since I was a kid, I've always liked art. I've always drawn. I've always mostly pencil work, you know, and I would sometimes do portraits and like family photos enlarge them and True. do these close to realistic looking portraits. And I did that when I was a kid. So I've always been art inclined, but my, through the amazing guidance of my parents, um, I was channeled to science, which I also liked, you know, so I was, I was good at it. Um, not the most fantastic, but I was, I was good at it. And I graduated from Federal University of Technology, Akure, with a degree in physics, um, advanced uh, physics, basically. The real course is um, electronics and solid states physics. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah. So, and in that course, we had a lot of uh, dealings with sensors. And um, um, it, it, I think it was like, beginning of like nanotechnology as well and things like that so we studied things like that we studied optics we did experiments in optics and you know putting lenses together yeah measuring this it's almost like and... your filmmaking training was doing press up in the background yeah, i know <laughs> so we're calculating focal lens and all those things from two lenses and the focal point and focal plane yeah convex and concave you know all those things so we were we're doing all that. And that happens to be my favorite subject, apart from energy. So I like energy. I like I liked optics in school. Um, every other thing like quantum, whatever, and all those things mm -hmm. was just... You just yeah, passing like, through. You just through. needed to pass your exams. Yeah. They were so abstract and we had no... They're not relatable. Were not really relatable. I could understand them to a certain level. But like without being in, for instance, if you go to some advanced school, you probably do some experimentations sure. in the laboratory that would allow you to understand those concepts a little bit better. But where we studied, unfortunately, we didn't have access to those things. We didn't even do like PCB, that's printed circuit board printing um, thing, which yeah. is like the circuits for software and I mean for... Uh, like boards like the like one which the, the software circuit controls board. hardware basically like, and like turn and yeah. have like yeah we didn't even make those things because the process actually for that funny is photographic so you you, you make your drawing you design you design your circuit um probably on paper sometimes maybe you do the initial sketch on paper there are softwares that you take it into and do the circuitry out and layout you do the adjustment so it looks good and it fits like as small as possible so that's where you have all those wire like those flat copper mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. on circuit mm -hmm. boards so when you do that there's a there's a photographic process that now takes place i think it's the silver halide thing as well which is the same used in like kodak film stock and exactly i'm like you so so you do the photography for that, and then you develop it like a film. It's during the development that it, that it turns to the copper you see on oh. the board, you know. So that was a like a photographic process. 
So, but like for electronics, electronics, you know. So instead of I think the silver thing, I've never really cover, thought, thought about how they were designed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did that, you know. So we went through all, but whilst uh, we were being chosen into different places to serve, um, I was placed in advertising for some reason. And I'd always said in school, before we finished that, it would be so cool to shoot a TV commercial. And I don't know where that comes from, but like someone in physics and possibly going into the world to do... So wait, you don't have any of the traditional tropes of your father gave you a camera, you picked up a camera somewhere, that, or any that of those things? That is kind of there, because um, when I was a child, um, there was this very bad uh, camera. I think it was a Polaroid. Because my memory, my memory serves me right. My father had a Polaroid camera. And I kind of remember it working at some point. You know, that stuff. Funny, I have that Polaroid, another Polaroid, I mean, a newer, a Polaroid in my car. But like, um, he, he, the thing I think spoiled at some point, and he just gave it to me. I remember myself as a toddler, and I would have it in my eyes and be clicking around. With it. And yeah, you just hear the speed. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you just hear the speed and you see it blink in there, but it wasn't doing so anything. So the picture was in your imagination. So, so, so the picture was in my imagination. I remember clearly I was doing that as a kid. And then as I was growing up, there was always some camera around. I was kind of like the family photographer. I was 35mm. So I was shooting 35mm. Uh, roles as a kid, like um, family events and stuff. There are some photos now in our gallery and stuff, but that are that are from me that I took, you know. So, and I would go to the lab and sit down. I don't know how it worked. I don't. Know. I just know you I wait. give them the camera. They take it in. They bring the camera back. I sit down, and then they will bring the strips. The strips. Then the printed. Yes. It will be in, in an envelope, envelope, and I'll go back home, and. I was doing that. And I never actually even gave that a thought until I started photography again. Like, oh, I'd always done this. You know, it's... It's been in the it's nature. Not new. <laughs> not new to me, you know. So... Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So when I finished NYC service at the agency, I was already processing my master degree in systems, uh, something, something, or IT, ICT something, master degree. Integration in, and... Uh... You know... So I, I was thinking it was going to be IT. So, but I'd started having doubts by then uh, because um, like eight months after that um, service was over, I got a call from the agency um, and the MD, uh, very nice man. That's another story how, how, you know, how great the man is and how instrumental he, he was to where I am today. You know, so he called me and he was like, Femi, you always said you wanted to do multimedia. Have you started learning anything by yourself now? By then, I'd gone to like... Left of ICT. I, no, I was actually still processing some, my master degree. But I'd also now gone to learn editing. I'd gone to learn a bit of photo manipulation and all those things. Um, you know, I was doing a bit of that. So I... I Automatically just said, oh, yes. Like, so officially, you are part of the people who never went to any film school of whatsoever. No, so. I never did. I never did. So That's anyway, cool. I go join the agency. He brought me now into multimedia department. So I started filming stuff and very little things. Started doing a bit of uh, 3D. Started doing web development and things like that, you know. And then I convinced that, like, that IT thing... A master degree, I'm not interested anymore. Is it okay for me to go study something else? So what do you want to study? I was in love with post-production by then. And I said, I'd like to do visual effects. And would you get a job when you come back? I said, I think so. I think I think this is going to be very lucrative. lucrative. And the industry was quite new. You know, I said, okay. He said, all right. Um, so he agreed and I swapped um, my application for something that was not too far from IT was in post-production world, but not too far into art. From film. 
Because <laughs> I was trying to play safe. Like, yes, however it goes. Yes. Okay, so, um, so I got this course that where um, the course was called uh, Advanced Multimedia Designs and 3D Technologies. It was under like computer science or computer engineering department. So it was easy to sell. Like, mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. if it does not work, mm -hmm. I'm still in IT. Mm -hmm. it's a, but anyway, whilst doing that course, we would usually film like um, red, the red one, giant and new lens and all those things. We would usually film, light the space, green screen, things so like that. So somehow you already started picking up the blueprints of what you wanted to do because you're like so, in the front seat. So I'm in the front seat, but usually the filming will be about grab this thing, light it well so it keys well, you know, those kind of mm -hmm. things, separate the background from the foreground, and then you go work on the visual effects. So I was, I think I was good enough, maybe not like crazy good, but like I was good enough with the visual effects thing. But I was enjoying the lighting and filming a lot more than I should, you know. So eventually, um, I finished that, I came back to Nigeria. I said, like, shooting documentaries for the same agency I left. Wait, wait, like, wait, wait. Pause, pause that yeah. for a bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. how, how was that for you, like, starting out? Because at this point, you can call yourself a DP, but you're, like, now no. in the media space. Yeah, yeah. So how was it for you trying to, like, source out those kind of jobs or those kind of creative opportunities? Because some of the difficult conversations for, for people who are, like, starting their journeys is literally there's no map in plugging in. Yeah. You get. Yeah. It's just like a wild west. Like, yeah. how was that for your own experience in picking up those small, small jobs and just how did that go? How did that elevate? Yeah. So I was lucky enough to have worked with the advertising agency. So I knew people in the industry. So when I came back, I knew I could. I was also looking like at the space and I felt, OK, apart from people working very high end stuff like the TV commercials and stuff like once it leaves, those companies that were coming from South Africa and all those things, I looked at my skill sets and how well I could do certain things at the time. I mean, it was still like early uh, periods. I was like, I can do better than a lot of the people doing it locally. I was like, I'll just put some reel together or some things I could shoot. I'll go to the agencies and people I already know and just tell sure them that I can shoot that stuff for you. And I was lucky enough to have people who just believed in me and they were just like, yeah, Femi can shoot that. So I was doing like some visual effects stuff for them or like 3D and stuff for them. But on the other hand, I was also shooting things for them. Oh, you, nice. you get so yeah. So it, it, so it kind of built up some kind of confidence rapport. It, it was, it was between... built and, and it, the cost was good. I was dead to cheap, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was very cheap. Like, yeah, so they would... Uh, there was a time I saw like an invoice quoted by another company that I just took a job away from. And I was like, what did I just do? You know, because it was like times 10 of what I asked for. I was like, I could make that kind of money. You, you had and, no clue. And so I was doing that. They won't pay me on time still. Mm -hmm. They won't, you know, like they were cheating me out of deals. They'll probably go take... 10 million from some clients and give me, say, the entire budget is 5 million. And, you know, you're lucky. Agency still has to take something out of it. No, I'm not lucky if the, if the project actually costs 4.5. No, no, you're really taking you're lucky, <laughs> you're right? I, I had mine worse. Yeah. Oh. You get. Yeah. I, I, I was, I, I had a happy accident someday in an agency that yeah. I shall not name. And I saw the billing. That yeah. was done to the client. The yeah. billing was for 15 million. Yeah. I saw how much was on my invoice. My invoice was 750K. Bro, that was it. That was that was quite similar. <laughs> that was quite, quite similar. So yeah. you look you. That's why yeah. I say you're If you had five, yeah. you blessed. And also, like, because you'd at that time, money wasn't ever at the top of my mind. My mind was deliver quality. So most times we spent everything we got on the project. Because I just wanted to make a point that we could do it and take some of the big, bigger jobs off, off, off the companies that were coming in and like charging everything, you know, to, to make, get them done. I was a, a bit naive about those costing things, but then we delivered what I, I believed at the time was, was great. good quality and 
you know, and we moved on to other things. So that was basically how I got into the industry, like filming. So quick question now. Yeah. If you look, if you had to look hindsight, right, and look at yourself, right? Yeah. What's the difference about being a DP at your level now? Yeah. Compared to when you started, the perspective oh, wow. shift. It's, it's massive. It's massive because you remember we couldn't even call ourselves DP. At true, point. true, true. We couldn't call ourselves cinematographers. We couldn't call ourselves. We, you we had, didn't know the difference. First yes, of all. yes. You, uh, yeah. I, I remember googling. What is the difference between a cinematographer, the of photography, and cinematographer, <laughs> or director of photography versus a cinematographer. cinematographer? Like, and I was like, there were questions. There were times I was like asking myself, like, can I call myself a DP now? And you're like, is it, is it possible? Am I a DP now? Actually, you know, because you felt that imposter syndrome so heavily that. Um, no, you must have. Now, you know, basically, like, you know when you're a DP. Yeah. Like, <laughs> because you always face and have to prove yourself. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You're like, always like, okay, am I good enough for this conversation? Yeah. Okay, so what's what's good about that guy's own bit that when, if yeah. you look at him, yeah. and you say, okay, yes, he's worth $10,000. What is he doing that I'm yet to actually get yeah, to understand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. get, because he must be contributing some some level of value. Yeah. And someday you may be lucky to even stumble on one of your set and you're like, okay, I will play the home and I will serve you coffee just to understudy and let me process yeah. that. Unfortunately, I didn't do that. Um, I think um, it, it was pro pa partly ego and it was partly like response from the people I reached out to. Um, who, I mean, it happens still. Like some people reach out to you and you respond to. Some people reach out and you just like... This one is not ready and you don't respond to, right? So I probably was one of those. And social media also was not like this, you know. It was, uh, yeah, it's true. so hand in hand now. Anybody can talk to anybody, talk to you and stuff. But like back then, like you reach out to like some people like up there and they just never respond. And so, and I hate embarrassments. Like, uh, like my personality like type, I like want to enter the ground like if I say hello and, and you don't say I'm, hi, you know. In fact, I don't. I don't do fanboy. I don't. I don't get excited. So how did you celebrity. develop your own tribe? If you were, was, because yeah, in this kind of uh, with your personality and what you've said, right? It's it may be it's just proper to say that surviving in this kind of world means that you have to develop a tribe of people who would really understand you. Yeah, who you could band together and be like, okay. Can we do this for next for nothing? Because we are trying to like let let's use the fish to yeah. hunt the whale. Yep. You yep. get. And we yep. all agree and like, okay, we are with one mind yeah. and we're gonna go about this. Yeah. You get. Yeah. And when you look at that kind of mindset, yeah, how much of that would you say um attributed to escalating your journey forward? Yeah. Um I think I think once I'm interested in something, I I face it hundred percent. I face it hundred percent. I think that's I think that's the trait. And one of I'm also an introvert. I learned to be able to talk. I learned to be able to face people. You understand? But um, naturally, I'm an introvert. I just want to be a dark, in a dark room, one window, and just work and just do what I needed to do. You know. And that was why like post production really suited me. Like. I was you could log the hours away. Yeah, you just need to reach me by phone or send me materials by email or I pick up a hard drive somewhere and I'm back in my zone. Your 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 entire world. And I'm doing it. Like, yeah, there's there's one photograph that I took, like a self-portrait one time like that, that kind of like fully describes I think your process. My my person. I, I don't know if you remember that 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 photograph. I was I was by a window. There was one oh, stream of yeah, lights yeah, like yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was a very dark room. I remember it was just that light coming to my table. Your table. And yeah. That was me. Like that was that was me. Wow. You know that's that's my kind of you know I, 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 especially like when I locked into learning this thing, that was just me, and I would have. A light or two in the room and I'll start playing around shapes and stuff okay um, that oh, or I see something come into the space accidentally maybe like the Sun just shines something a bit. Wow. bounces somewhere be like hmm. light so where's, where's that Sun coming from that's like an angle of something okay 
Okay. So we, in all of this, right, that yeah. you're actually just piecing together, there was not like a formal progression, like a curriculum education that you set out for yourself that you know, like, okay, for example, if this was an institution, there's like the basics, yeah. camera language, mm -hmm. um, knowing your camera, knowing the sensor, mm -hmm. knowing how to frame, compose. none of that existed for you. It was just like you were piecing that together in yeah, the I mean, way they I, were coming. Yeah, I, I gathered that from like studying online mostly. Uh, there were materials that materials started popping up around the time I decided to become a DP, like full-time DP. Materials started popping up online that were helpful before it was really hard to find. Um, was this the time Shane sprung? Shane, yeah, I think we met on Shane. Yes, we did. Shane, how about like a lot of DPs our era actually grew out from of Shane. Shane. And you know, I I was discussing with another friend of ours who like was from the same world and some weeks ago like nah shane shane the credits to you changed. shane like credits yeah, to credits, you like shane changed our lives you know sure. it, 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 around the time when we're asking the question what is filmic yes what is, what is cinematic? cinematic what is cinematic what is filmic some of the people will tell you grains when you mm -hmm. add you're like grain, you're like why do I do that? Us, like different things you buy grains um, grayscale gorilla. Yes, 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 yes. You buy grains, you buy this, you buy that, and be like, still not there. No, it's it still not looking look look like that guy's one. <laughs> like, what do they do? And then Shane was like, it's all light. Yes, it's all light. And then Shane was breaking down process. And that was like, I remember, I remember emailing Shane after I watched Act of Valor. This was after they released yeah. the fight, and I emailed him on LinkedIn like, Hey Shane, would it be possible to like mentor under you? And I was like. There's no chance this guy is going to respond. He responded to me as well. I sent an email to him as well. Oh, shit. He did? Yeah, he was like... I, I was shocked. I'm like, an AS is responding to yeah, what? So, yeah, so yeah, yeah. And he wasn't taking money. No, he wasn't. Because people people like to forget that time. When yes. He was released. Because he was like... For free. Um, you know? I'm starting up a close inner circle. Yeah. Right? It's no, that was even be, later. That was later. After the article, was releasing made, articles. Remember? A lot of these Blog posts on... Yeah. Um, for um, free. The Harvard, um, is this Shane? How about visuals? visuals. So. That was, he had like a blog where he was like going through all the films and doing the breakdowns. Then when he now became organized, that's when he moved to like the inner circle yeah, yeah. and curated the experience yeah. more better. I think, yeah. And I think even when he started taking money, I think it was worth every dime. Like even so, when I felt I didn't need that anymore, I paged that thing for like two years extra or something. Because seriously, before I eventually said, okay, you know what? I we can I've walk on our feet now. <laughs> yeah. I think I've graduated from this. But like that was, I think that was the most structured part of my um, of your journey. early learning. Um, the other parts were just like, uh, go get, grab articles or find some um, ASC, ASC magazine, magazine somewhere. And so by later, I subscribed to that. But before subscribing, I'll just try Google and see if I can find a free one, which I got from different places. You see, or oh, this process, that process, yeah. this, that, this, you know. And... You know, you email or you reach out to some of those DPs as well, and it's silence. True. You understand? Like, true, true. They, There's plenty they, of that. They don't respond. And so I just thought, okay, you know, the best way to do this is just keep practicing and pay for materials that you can find um, that, you know, tell you quality stuff like Shane's. And some other blogs like Tim Palmer, you remember? Tim yes, Palmer? yes, yes. Yeah, whom I actually, I actually met him. Um, a, a gaffer friend of mine who I've worked with a couple of times was working with him, and they, they are good friends as well. So I was like, do you want to come on set and meet Tim? Because I've talked to him about learning from Tim's blog. So I went, I went on their set, met him, and stuff. Like, nice guy. Wow. So yeah. So, but. Wow. But his uh, blogs was is still very very uh, was very helpful, you know, because he also posted his process and he updated them quite frequently as well. Every job he was doing, he was updating tools and things he was using. Wow, he was putting on there. And um, you remember there was a time I was working mostly with photography modifiers. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, yes, I remember that time. Yeah, it was after I saw Tim use like octoboxes to light. And he described why, because um, they were quick, they were fast. 
he didn't need to have too many setups to get soft light. You know, things like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he was using like this five feet or seven. Sounds like feet. the era came TV started popping up. Yeah. So, you know, so yeah, just picked bits and pieces from but different quick places. Question, yeah. though. Um, as you were growing, mm -hmm. was there not like a challenge of being the smartest guy in the room, knowing that film is like a village? And sometimes some of the materials and mediums you've been exposed to in, on set and on the field, some of the guys or the crews you may be working with may not yet be that. No. And there's like the burden of re-education and like looking for the willing minds to like, I don't know, surround yourself to be able to create your own miniature yeah. ecosystem. How could you handle that learning curve and your own growth of progression? Because largely of what you do is influenced by them. Yeah. You get it. It's influenced by them, but I think um, if you're... If you're trying to be a cinematographer remotely, I mean, remotely in the sense of the fact that we didn't have, um, I mean, there were some guys that were already like doing big stuff, like, you know, at the time, you know, that you look at and be like, oh, wow, they're working on some big stuff, you know, but like, I don't even really think they were getting the opportunities they deserved at, that, at the time or that they could, they could be doing, I, I, you know, but, um, what usually happened was you just force people to work in a certain way or you force, um, for instance, the crew you mentioned to do things. I've, I've been on set and Gaffer told me, we don't do it that way. And he was refusing to do what I was asking for. It was like, no, we don't, we don't do it that way. I was like, that's how I want to do it. And it was like, smacking like this but this what? French guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So it's you know? almost like the context of your... So so they were used to a certain way and they would force you into that way. Or like they frustrate you by wasting your time till you say, okay, carry on. Just do, just do yourself. Yeah, so we can move because you're spending money. You don't have tomorrow, you know, like limited, um, limited resources and all. And they just force you to... So it was frustrating at first, but once... Once you you saw a couple of people who saw that, okay, I think you're trying to do things a little bit differently, and they were happy to tag along, they they would support, they would support, they would work with you, or at least take direction mm. for how you want things placed, how you want things diffused, mm -hmm. how you want, and it happens at all levels. Like even at this level, there are times I'm explaining something to. Um, for instance, a gaffer, and they're saying um, the way they want to do it, or like they're trying to force how they want to do it. Or you get on set and they tell you, uh, yeah, that initial idea, which I already spotted they're not cool with, they tell you, yeah, so because we're running out of time, um, yeah, it will take a long time to set up, let's go the other way. And you'd have to stand your ground sometimes. And sometimes you'd have to give it up. Pick your battles. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes you'd have to give it up. Because, I mean, they are also contributors. True. You know? And sometimes you'd have to force it that, look, it wouldn't look the way I'm trying to make it look if we don't... Do it do that it. certain way. No. Um, yeah. So, um, especially when it comes to things like lighting for... Uh, like a lot of people like to refer to lighting black skin tones, you know. Um, there are certain That's an things, interesting subject. <laughs> there are certain things you do that complement uh, a black, a darker skin tone uh, than a uh, Caucasian or, me, do, yeah. or, or, or lighter skin tones. And some people are only used to working with Caucasian skin tones, for instance. And they tell you um, what's the difference between Oh, there it is. Using this light and that light. Or like, or just want to tell you your process is going to take a longer time and doesn't seem like we have that time. But you know you're not going to get the shape on the face that you, you, you were want. looking for or you wanted if you go by a certain way, you know? So you just force it and eventually they see the image and they come back to you and be like, you were right, you were right. And said, so I'll add it to my, my, my kit. <laughs> you know, like, you arrive. Right. And sometimes it's the other way. 
you say this and they say, look, there was something I did some time ago. Would you like to try that? Be like, oh yeah, definitely. You know, because and that's one of the reasons also why it's better to work to with, work with very people like, who, who are ahead of you. People in terms of work and the you know the portfolio. You as a leader in the position of being a director of photography or a cinematographer, how do you balance the closed and open words of crewing up with very experienced people? And growing up with green people that are like passion oriented. Yeah, I think I think I think both uh, should be mixed. Because um, on one hand, you don't want to mess around with um, clients' work. Um, clients um, doesn't a lot of times don't care about uh, someone's green, someone's experience. They only care about their yeah, outputs because that's what they've paid for. Output. Now, who can do? Who can get the job done best? Is usually your first concern as a DP. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's why you've got like heads of departments and then things go down from there. Like you have hierarchy. So if you're going to go with a gaffer, I, I think it makes sense to go with an experienced person. And then people under the gaffer can be from various mm -hmm. um, experiences. For, for instance, um, do you have a spark? who, um, I mean, you're hiring the spark, you can't go for an inexperienced person because of the kind of dangers that may come with that. Yeah, that you, have to, you have to hire, but like the spark may have an assistant who's more green and learning under them, or like um, the gaffer might have an assistant. And understudy that's a lot more green. Who, yeah, who's more green. Or, and also like, um, in general, that's why you have roles like the runner roles and um, the production uh, assistant. Production assistants, like it's usually like a place for people to come in and learn and work their way upwards, um, or like uh, the lower AC roles um, that don't really impact on the quality of the image, but like um, can be easy to or easier to learn and to step into. So those for those roles, you can bring in like greener people to start being on set, to start learning and start contributing and hopefully make money as well. But um, the the job comes first, unfortunately. So speaking of still... when you just said make money as well, before I dive into your work proper, mm -hmm. right? Um, what's your take on the concept of work for free? Work for free. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's never ideal. It's never ideal. But like, I think we've all been through different phases mm -hmm. um, of this career. And I think uh, those phases shaped us, right? And some of those things you, you may never be able to get on if you weren't open yourself or open to like those kind of some some of those roles you know just like there are a couple of people that i'm trying to push into the industry now that i see that oh they could do well in this role in that role and the question would usually be uh are you willing to go there and just be on set they won't pay you for this one but like you meet people you start seeing how things are done and hopefully by a couple by the time you go a couple of times, you come in. So um, I think it depends on the individual. I, on the producer end of things, if I were, I, I still wouldn't make someone work on set without giving them something. I, I wouldn't. But I understand why that may be a thing. And I understand why it's necessary for young creatives to just jump at some of those opportunities as well to go do. But for a professional, for a professional to be called um, to come work for free and maybe not your friend's group, like maybe like you guys are just, you just have this passion project uh, that you want to do. I mean, which- Like balancing the creative you, you versus the you understand, view paint job. Like a proper professional, you're being called to come and work on a job, on a project that is paid for, and for free, I think is a bit... Mm. <laughs> the edge. Yeah, I think it's a bit... Yeah. Yeah. 
I think it's a bit wild. So, so. I, I was going through a couple of your works and yeah. I was really astounded by um, the documentary you did for um, <clears throat> the cloud um, care sound space um, um, job. Oh. The sound, yes, that 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 entire um, documentary, right? A source of inspiration. Mm. Yeah, and can you like just walk us a little bit through your process of minimalism and how that plays into um, earlier in the earlier in the conversation? You spoke about yourself as an introvert and how you've curated your word to be like very precise and pristine. And see, hearing that and seeing this, I could connect the dots. But just for um, people out there who are still like trying to figure out themselves and their process, yeah. right? Just discuss a little bit of it and how you being you played into that entire visual spectrum in terms of your choices. Okay. Um, that's an interesting way to, an to ask a question. But... Okay, minimalism, right? Yes. Okay. Um, I think I think it was what the um, the job um, required. I think it was what it required. Um, the director, um, Israel Peters, um, reached out to me with a specific idea of what he was trying to achieve. You know, and most times as well, we're guided by what. Um, the director's vision is, you know, as cinematographers. Sometimes we chip in, or most times we chip in to say, oh yeah, why not think of it in the other direction rather than this? But like, I was on board with this when I saw what they had done before um, um, with this series of visuals that they were doing for, I think the same brand. So when he mentioned, when he shared the mood board and things like that and where they were trying to take things, yeah, I, I just looked um, at what we could do to um, get that story told visually, like how we're going to frame what would be in our background. So does that play into like your choice of your kids? Or, yes. You know, sometimes yeah. um, there's like this whole, what you're comfortable with. I want this, I want that, I want yeah. this, like your repertoire. Yeah. You yeah. get And yeah. maybe you now look at this, you're not like, maybe I should just surrender and let go of all of this and like... So, yeah. So so, so there's there's an element of that because we had two parts to the, the, the documentary work. We had like the interior scenes and... Um, we had the exteriors. So for the exteriors, mostly um, we didn't have setups for lighting and things like that. Maybe we had bounce or negative. So you're literally playing to the time of day. So you're playing with the time of day. You're, you're looking at where the sun is at, where the sun is going to be when you take certain shots. Or you're, for instance, you find certain things in there that like are dark foregrounds and like mid grounds, like in a foresty kind of mm -hmm, thing. Mm -hmm. And it's majorly you just saying, okay, you know what? If we stand close to this, there's the blanket of cloud coming in there. That's your key. If you move a little bit close to this, the forest is here and it's that darker, your neck. And that's your neck. And then you, you find that angle to film. So it looks like you've actually lit, you know, whereas if you had gone on the other side, it would have looked totally different, Flat, yeah. you know? So those are the things we were doing. We're looking for like shades, and light so shoot into hot background or something and keep the person in the dark so on the other side you're having the feel or the shape uh come through or like um just time of the day you know we just we were shooting around pockets and you know there was a time as well when we brought them in we brought one of the um, um artists into like hot sunlight and it was like super bright and everything. We let everything kind of burn wow. out. And um, yeah, I could probably show you something. Like how significant yeah. is it choosing, um, say, camera companies based on what you're doing? You know, back in the day when we were shooting 70s, yeah. they had limitations, they were technological yeah. limitations. Yeah. But from a perspective and having like been a full grown yeah. cinematographer yeah. at your level, how significant are those choices nowadays in maybe you're shooting on a red, uh, an IRI, a camera? You mean the choice of... Yes, the choice, choice of, 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 yes, of tools yeah, nowadays. Choice. Yes. Because there's this conversation, back in the day, there was a conversation of that was valid based on technological limitations that we could spot gaps. Is yeah. that a thing? 
or you're not like more into yourself as the artist and and it's just not like more about you because technology has gotten so better that you could paint with almost any brush. Yeah. How's that working for you? I think it's more about the artist. Um, I may be, I'm a strong believer of that. I think you could tell your story with any of the top digital formats out there, for instance, and they'll maybe not exactly look the same, but you get, you get you know, what you're looking for. I think the more important thing to learn and to focus on is your lighting. Your lighting. You had that. Maybe tip number one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think I think that's the first thing to focus on. Focus on learning how to light. You know, and there are several ways to do that. You know, there, like we said before, there are materials um, everywhere online now that you could search. And but like you could also look into nature how nature does its things, the accidents, like the, you understand, like mm -hmm. you could pick keys from it. that, like just being present, um, you're outdoors, you're somewhere, there's some lights there and someone is sitting there and you see how it falls on their faces, just look around and just be present. You find, you find a lot of tips in there for how you should do things. But in terms of like sensors, they are all kind of competing in the same dynamic range area now. Yeah. And they are all competing with the same resolutions now. In fact, a lot of the sensors are made by the same company. Just oh. put into different... Put into different different pipelines. Engines, you know, yes. like, you know, it's... Um, yeah, Almost like yeah. that's the Viedlin test that he, he did with several formats and he, he was like, he, yes. match the... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, what, what would differ would be how... Each person is reading off the sensor and interpreting it. The data. Um, interpreting the data. That's different. But I think they've all gotten so good now that you can get good uh, uh, footage from any um, any sensor, really. And one, one of the things I usually tell people is, until you can tell me for a fact, by apart from like film formats, which is also now becoming confusing. Oh, we will get there. <laughs> which is also becoming so confusing now because there are ways now to grade to, to come very close come really close to this thing so you can't actually justify really justify or maybe you can justify but like you can't actually really tell the difference true anymore. true true you know if it's well done if it's properly yes. done but like you have until you can tell me by by just looking at a scene and and say oh that's a rialto or uh, i mean a venice or that's a alexa lf or that's True. a red. True. Uh, it's not possible. Raptor. Unless you can do that, then I would believe we should kill ourselves about what we get. I think work with whatever you have. Um, as agree. long as it's not like um, the old VHS. Yes, yes. And that still has its place if it leans to the No, story. it has its place. Because I actually saw a film recently uh, by director Tommy Siadek Betu and uh, shot by Olan actually. And they used the old VHS, VHS tape. And the footage looks so dirty, like so dirty. But it has this nostalgia, like, because um, the, the story also had to do with like going back home, like someone in the UK who's lived their lives out in the UK mm -hmm. and now coming back home. And the footage felt like home for some reason. Like it felt so... Um, familiar fo so familiar like with what you knew or if you go into your dad's wardrobe and took out the vhs of old party mm -hmm, that mm -hmm, you recorded mm -hmm. and that was what they were trying to get wow and you, you understand so that i think that's what matters like what's the purpose what's your story does the medium support what you're trying to pass on to viewers if it does, go ahead and use. I'm really super excited that you said that because it leads me to your next work that's called Chasing the Night. Damn, that Chasing that was oh. that was beautiful. Like, yeah, thank you. Like you were true and through through that work. Like, thank you. first of all, how did that happen? Okay. Second, because mm -hmm. it's a series of questions, because I have like questions that yeah. I'm really excited about. How did you come about that floating camera language? It's almost like that it is never ending, it is searching, just how did you how did you get to that level of expression? Like how did how did this all happen that you got like, okay, this would be my kit, this would be our visual language, yeah. I, this is how I would complement the director's story. Because I know you may have received it as a script that you ingested, mm -hmm. and the director will probably give you his input. But mm -hmm. how did you arrive at that level of inspiration to like execute in the way you deliver that? 
Okay. Um, let me think for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, really stoked when I saw it. Yeah. Like it was so damn good. Yeah. I think um, I think the first I think the first question. Um, how did it come about? Yeah. Um, I think I'll start with that. And um, so uh, the director, Abraham Adeyemi, and um, Abiola Rufai Awojide, who happens to be my wife and the producer, they've, um, they've been working on certain visuals over the years and stuff, and they, they wanted to do this particular one. And most of because i think things um maybe i don't know for what reason maybe funding or something um like dates shifted and the initial the, um, dp that was supposed to uh um, shoot couldn't and um eventually they came to me and was like are you happy to are you happy to shoot it and i was like oh yeah definitely why not and why not and so um i think the story was nice and was great and um had fantastic actors um, attached to it. Oh, yeah, like, there was. And who doesn't want to light and shoot beautiful people, right? And um, a beautiful story. So I, I totally agreed and jumped on board um, the idea. And we didn't have a lot of prep time, but we spent some time together, um, director and I, um, thinking through what we're trying to achieve. And one of the things I could recall him saying is these, because um, the, by the nature of the film, um, they're practically hiding. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They, it's it's a forbidden love yeah. genre. So they are they're practically hiding from everybody else. So God, it felt it's, like it's, in the mood for love in a different way. Oh, yeah. Like yeah. I felt that you know in the mood for love, like one can why would always like put them in tight spaces yeah. and like frame in frames yeah. and always like in the shadows and yeah. all of, but that was like Asia. Yeah. But this was me getting something similar. Yeah. But from yeah. this new community, I'm like, wait, 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 yeah. wait. So that was that was actually interesting because one of the references was in Mood for Love. And um, if Bill Street could talk, and if I'm gonna confess here right now, I've not watched it either. <laughs> I've not. You seen, haven't. No, I haven't. I've I've not. See, there, there are a couple of films I've not watched. I think I'm a rebel. Um, I think once everybody starts referencing a certain film, I don't want to watch it. Because, Why? Because we feel like it. it... I, I think I think because um, I don't know what it is, but I hate being influenced by um by um a specific by visual a specific visual. Uh, I just hate the idea of being influenced by specific visuals. I'm not going to deny I've seen things from them and stuff like that, but I've never really studied those films. I've never watched them. You know, Bill, if Bill Street could talk, um, I probably played, played two minutes of the beginning and stopped and said, Barry oh, Jenkins. I'm going to, yeah. And I'm, I'm sure it's a brilliant film. I've seen some of his other works and, and even... Um, Underground uh, Railroad. On the ground, I've not seen Underground Railroad. Oh. Yeah. I've seen Moonlight now. Oh, I only like, just saw Moonlight this year. Who was the other one of the guys that was playing <laughs> piano that he wore, that won the Oscar for best cinematography? Uh, yeah. Where he man, ah, I forgot him. Well, yeah, I remember yeah. that. I think I've, I've seen that one. But yeah, so but I think I just usually rebel like once everybody's reference. I'm like, I'm not gonna watch it. I'm still gonna make good visuals, you know. Like, but um, I see the reason why. You know, you have, we pick inspirations from everywhere. That's yeah, true. true. So like, you're not an island. Regardless true. of if you watch it or not, you're still influenced by certain things. So like, that's just me being... So what was, yeah. what was your, what was your like, camera package isn't significant, but what was like your lighting design like? Like, like okay. your choices of okay. lenses, like what did you yeah. shoot on? Okay, so because the story, the story had to do with these people sneaking around the night and all those things. One of the first things I thought was, you know what? I think one of our major light for those spaces would be under lighting, like just placing the light um, mm -hmm, down mm -hmm, there mm -hmm. to kind of. Um, I also usually like because I watch a lot of fashion films. Um, um, I like if you go on my YouTube, if you say fashion film, you probably see that red line nearly on everything. I watch them like a lot, and one of the things I like about fashion photography is that they don't run from that edge. The, the mm, light, yeah, the light yeah, that, yeah, that comes the nose. Yes, like especially when when the uh, um the actor or talent has a beautiful facial shape, 
like that nose, that nose shadow, that curve under, mm -hmm. like or the eyes or the light in the eyes, like just coming slightly from under and all those things has always been so attractive to me. And I felt, you know what, if you're, if you're sneaking around these places, I wouldn't like a top light because they literally would want to sit around the darkest of the spots as well. Oh. Nothing so nothing late, coming, in. Nothing coming yeah. in. But maybe like a table lant lantern or table lamp will be there, you know, and that would be our motivation for the What's light. coming from there? So most of my lighting was built from down um, to come into scene and then I just wrap it up a little bit on the sides. And wow. that was that was how we are. But nothing really coming from up. If you look at wow. most of them, except in the scene where they had a group and they were all talking in the in the group, like in the, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, the yes, colorful yes. scene. Like what lenses did you use though? Because so it had we, this yeah this interesting quality that yeah. I I couldn't place my hand on. Yeah, almost like split vein between vintage and um, very clinically clean. Yeah, I think that's a good way to describe uh, what the lenses were and. It's from um, Panavision. It's Panavision um, Ultra Primes. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I think the Mark IIs or, or three or something. And they were like crazy, crazy beautiful, you know. And oh, the, the thing about them also is they don't really match. Um, different focal lengths don't really match. For instance, you'd see, um, I think on, was on a 50 or something, you have a 1.1. And on the 24, you have some crazy wide 24, um, wide aperture, uh, 24, you know, different things like mm -hmm. that. And they were, um, they were, you know, different, different mm -hmm. characters. Yes, exactly. Different. But the thing that kind of ties all of them together was that they weren't sharp at all. Yes, they uh, were not. Especially because we're also shooting wide open. Yeah. Um, they weren't sharp. Like, you wouldn't see crisp sharpness. Sure. Um, they had this very vintage -y, Feel. Kind of thing, feel and um yeah i i really loved working on those on the alexa mini which was what we used for that wow but, so this yeah. this brings me to a different question how do you balance working with tools you've never worked before so at your level right mm -hmm. you could look at the project and maybe you've never worked in techno cream before and you're like i think this would be like a tech how do you get to stand in that confidence to say okay i am shifting out of my comfort zone there's a 50-50 chance I may fall on my face, mm -hmm. but my gut tells me that's the gut call to make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you get to do yeah. that? I mean, a lot of times as well, maybe cause of prayer and the kind of team you have around you because you're not the one to mount the techno crane, really. You know what it does. You know what it does. You know what you're trying to achieve. You know that's the only thing, possibly, uh, the only thing that can achieve what you want to achieve. And you talk to the professionals who would have your back. Do you get to go yeah. to rental houses and just test on your free time? Yes, 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 I do that. So you have those relationships that allow yes, you have Yes, you have those relationships and you just go in and be like, I have this idea and I would like to test it out. And be like, yeah, we're free on so -so dates, our rooms are free, come in. And then this, they bring everything out for you and sometimes they won't help you set up. And Wow. Yeah, and they just support you. And a lot of times, it, even like, Sometimes you've not even you're not even hiring a lot from them, or like you've not even hired from them, but they're always welcome. I mean, they're always welcoming you know, the, for you to come in and, and test and, and do stuff. Also, build a relationship with them. So, wow, uh, it's easier. It's easier that way. Um, yeah, because the industry is quite big as well. So um, your tools won't go out all the time. Because there are also a lot of other people that's also companies. doing the same so thing. So sometimes the tools will be there. And sometimes some of these lenses, especially like with Panavision and things like that, uh, or places like that, you have lenses they built for Kubrick or whoever. It's so just like the shelf. That's just there in the shelf. And someone just discovers it and says, I read about this. Do you still have it? Oh, yes, we do. And they maintain them so well. They, it's not because it's in a shelf, it's gathered. Um, dust and dust, dust. Fun, fungi or whatever. Like they are well maintained and you just go there and be like, can I try that? Like, is it, it's a, yeah, it's available. And you go try, you know? And yeah, if you like it, you use it for a project. Speaking from the perspective of where you are in your career, right? Let's bring it home. Where do you think are the stop gaps 
in our industry that we may need to bridge, whether it's scale gap or um, um, exposure to deliberate intent to actually move in a certain way that would move the entire culture of the industry forward. Yeah. Right. And how do you think we can bridge gap? Because yes, you were from here yeah. and your journey has led you to a different perspective and place whereby you've been able to experience different and you'll be able to tell, um, you can tell the gaps that's between the two cultures yeah. Yeah. you get. So if you're supposed to like stay in an optimization role, what would you suggest as like possible path forward that can help the Nigerian cinematography industry move like yeah. a tad step better than yesterday? Yeah. I think, I think what I would suggest would be first education. I think we need to have, I think the government by now should see that this industry is helping a lot of people. This industry is feeding a lot of people and this industry is bringing a lot of money in, into the economy. And this is all with little to nothing to no help. You understand? People have literally built these things off their back. I remember to, I mean, you you buy stuff and you bring stuff in. Yeah. Like the breakneck tax you pay <laughs> on, on, on bringing tools in at all was what discouraged me from buying anything else. Like, it's like you're paying 20 something. Is it 21? Oh, Jesus. Oh. It's not more. Oh, it was, yeah. it, they, they've increased it like, they increased tax by 100%. They increased duty by 100. I think duty is like 150%. Yeah. They're literally killing people. Because to get like, yeah. for I, a fact, this 2090s was the biggest shock I had in my life. When yeah. I got the news, like my light has arrived. It was great. But when I saw the tax that, I mean, the, the yeah. duty clearing, I was like, what? It's not cool. It's not. Now we can't make these things here because no. the government also has not put things in place for, um, the like manufacturing no to, that, that, to, you, that's you, you understand yeah so we can't even make these things here but we're bringing these things in the industry is feeding so many people i think there needs to be d data for how many people are actually working on set in nigeria every day uh, that would be an interesting data to collect i was on a set yesterday to visit to visit a friend and i only knew like three people on that set Wow. And it's a full feature. Like, they were doing a feature. Like, people wow. who've been working. Like, I only know three people. I was on, I was, the shoot I had um, a couple of nights ago, um, met some guy who was, who I was meeting for the first time as well. I was like, I was like, I've only, I've only recently heard about you. He was talking to me. And I was like, well, it's a, it's a small <laughs> industry. But it's also a big place. You know, there's a lot of professionals working. You know, how many DPs were in Nigeria before I left and how many DPs are working are there right now? now? Like space of two years, you have people who are working on some of the biggest stuff you've seen. Sure. You know? Sure. Like, and like you see a lot of young people absorbed from universities, absorbed from no education, absorbed from nothing into the industry. That's an industry taking people off the streets, you know, to give to put something on their tables. Wow. You know? And I, I feel it's unfair in 2024 not to have like incentives for those producers, from for those execs. To be able to do to more. be able to do more, you know? To be able to pay I hear more. Abuja had like a um, tax back scheme, like if you shoot there, shooting in but Abuja. I but I don't know. I don't even know whether it's even valid. Like if the office is like valid yeah. to recognize that kind of request. I mean, that's good if it's there, but like you get, it, it's good because some things I could like, be information that exists on paper, yeah. but it cannot like be materialized. Yeah, physical. It's, it's 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 nice if it's there. I won't knock that, but I think if if anything like that is in Abuja, why isn't it replicated everywhere else? Why is especially Lagos and uh, is it uh, Calabar with the Tinapa where, studio? Not even Tinapa now. Um, when the East is popular for filming, um, Asaba. Asaba. Why is why are things like that not replicated? People are still like suffering. Um, you, you understand? I, I don't really want to go too much into politics of things. So, but, so yeah. I would have two questions for you to round this up. One is, how do you maintain work-life balance as you grow? Balancing the creative jobs versus the bill paying jobs versus your time with your family and all of that. And number two, if you had to look back at yourself 
right? What would you tell your younger self to anybody who's coming up that also may find themselves on this your path? What would be the best advice you give them that will set them up for success? Mm. Okay. Um, the first one, work-life balance. I think I'm still fine. I'm, I, I think I could do more, you know, like, um, I, I don't think I'm shooting often as often as I would like to um, yet. So I, I think I'm still fine. So the few projects I do um, it isn't really taking much away from me, you know. Um, so I, I don't think that really would apply to me right now. Um, if I was shooting like every, so you raised like got the rabbit hole. No, yeah, 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 exactly. So if if I was shooting like every week or doing something major every single month, then I'll be like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, you find a way to, you know. But I mean, I, I think why would why I'd like to do more, especially with my uh, wife, is uh, travel. You know, maybe when because she's busy as well, she's a producer, so. Um, maybe when we get that time, maybe just maybe just travel and experience new places and stuff to relax because we don't get to rest. Even if we're not working, we're working. If you know what I mean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. always researching something or next. It's always prep. You're good yeah, as the next. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're prepping for the next thing and all those things. So it might be nice to you know. I mean, the only time would usually uh, maybe not be. Uh, working is when we go somewhere. When we leave. So just log off. So and we just what we usually agree on is um, we're dropping our laptops. We can take the iPads and things like that. Maybe your camera. Um, yeah, even the last trip we went, I dropped my cameras. I wow. only went with the Polaroid. Wow. And that was and I went with 16 shots. So they had um, to count. Yeah, they had to count. And it was for us. You know, like it wasn't for landscape or anything. And every other thing would be on my phone. So so that, number one, I'm not traveling for photography. I could easily get absorbed in that. I travel by myself. If I'm traveling by myself, I travel with nothing less than four cameras. Like 16mm, <laughs> 35 uh, Which one? Um, the, the K3 or the either, Bullets? Either the K3 or the Bullets. I decide which one either. I saw something you recently shot that was on film, though. That was really interesting and oh, yeah. beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So I shot that partly here and finished it there. over there. Yeah. So, yeah, so I would usually just travel with some sort of either analog or digital. I've got a, bull I've, I've got a Polaroid with me right now, got a 35mm, got an R5 Canon. I've got my phone. Wow, you know, that's a lot of cameras. <laughs> with on on one trip, wow. so it could it could easily take over. So when we're going together, what I've decided to do, and she conveniently agreed, is to drop all my cameras, and I go hmm. with my mobile phone, and um, maybe now a Polaroid. Um, yeah, maybe other times, maybe I'll take just the thirty-five mm tool of choice and wow and, yeah. so if you if you if you're supposed to like um look back in time to talk to your younger self to optimize the decisions you've made up to now that have brought you here mm -hmm. what would be like the step-by-step -step process you'll be okay if there are like five things you should do that would probably get you a little bit more efficient to where i am yeah what would that be i mean if you have the vision early enough i don't think i had the vision to be a cinematographer early enough my journey is a little bit different, right? But if you have a vision early enough, get to it as quickly as possible. <laughs> you know, get to it as quickly as possible. It's um, like, that's why like, I have people I'm mentoring now who the youngest of them now just turned 18 and he's already working in second AC capacity. And like, you, I probably sent you a CV. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Fantastic CV already. Like, been pushing him around. He's, he's doing photography now. He's worked with the likes of Dami Twitch, doing BTS photography on their project and all those things. My old 7D, if you remember. Yeah, the very first I, one. I sent, I, he's with him. Like, I gave it to him with a lens, with a kit lens. And Have he, you noticed that the you people know, you tend to hand off those kind of things to, that people, quote and unquote, it's almost like you're handing over a mantle. Yeah, it is. But also, you already kind of see some, something in them. Yeah. This, 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 um, this my, um, is my nephew, um, has been... Um, if I show you some image from like when he was before 
10. You see his father's, because his father did videography. You see his father's giants, this thing. Ah. Hey, like, he's been so interested in this for a long time. And I felt, you know what? Instead of this guy going to do computer science, which, you understand? Or work in a bank. Again, because I'm seeing myself, which comes yeah. back to the question is like, going to study computer science and do it for five years and days and then coming back out and then realizing that, oh, I'm actually going to be a DP. You know, <laughs> I think that, yeah, I think you could as well that, start now yeah. and then channel a couple of years into experience and then go for your study as a cinematographer. Oh. So that's the plan, you know. So so those are mentoring now from like a young, like that young age. That's what I'm trying to do with them. Like, look, just get into it. Um, get into it, immerse yourself. I'll send materials, read and tell me, summarize and send back to me. Um, I teach them even how to write emails and how to, you understand, reach out to people. Because it's the business side. Yeah, it's like how to nego just... negotiate, you know, things like that. So I think that's more of what people should focus on. If you want to be in that industry, just get to it. Like, you don't need a degree to be a cinematographer. You just you need get, proof of you work. You just need education, you know, and proof of work, you know. So the earlier, the better. The better. That's what I'm going to say. Wow. Yeah. So I would say thank you for indulging me in this one-hour conversation that we've yeah, had. Yeah, thanks for having me. And it's been really, really, really feisty. And re I'm, I'm really stoked. I'm really stoked. I'm yeah, really thanks, happy this thanks happened. For, thanks for Because that. I mean, like, one man is an island. Yeah. I do these videos now and then based on my opinions, but mm -hmm. it's a wealth of information. Just hearing you talk, you get, and bringing so much contribution and value to the table. Yeah. And being that you're also from the culture here, mm -hmm. and also the insight and the and the, um, the the significance it brings to all those who still have this aspiration and dreams. Yeah. yeah. So I would like to say a big thank you from me. Thank you, sir. And um, hopefully the next person we get, I don't know who it is, but let's just see how this goes. Yeah. We just keep pushing them one at a time. I really appreciate it, man. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks yeah, a lot. Thanks, man. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, so that's it from me. Until next time, as I say, improvise, adapt, and overcome. Thank you. Peace out.